Hello, this is Brother Kumar from the Math Department, and these next videos will be covering Lesson 17, which is dealing with inference for one proportion. So first of all, we'll be talking about confidence intervals, and then we'll be wrapping it up with hypothesis testing. But before we do that, let's talk about the difference between a parameter and a statistic. A parameter is a measure of the population that, that is typically unknown, but we'd like to estimate. For instance, the population mean is a parameter that we covered in Unit 2. Now what we'll be covering is, in this unit, is the population proportion. Okay. So now, on the other hand, a statistic is a measure from the sample, and the statistic is used to measure the unknown parameter. So for instance, our sample mean x bar okay, is used to estimate our population mean, and our sample proportion, which is p hat, is used to estimate the population proportion, which is p. Also, I wanted to review Lesson 16, the distribution of a sample proportion. A sampling distribution is many sample proportions from many samples. However, due to time and money, one cannot take multiple samples or sample the whole population, so we infer based on one sample. So the statistic, or p hat, or our sample proportion, from the sample can be anywhere within the sampling distribution. So down below here represents a distribution of of the sample proportion. The center here represents our, tr our true proportion, or, or p. And we could, from our sample, we could get a p hat here, a sample proportion of p hat here, p hat here, so on and so forth. Now say, for instance, that this is p, and over here is p hat. Is that going to be a problem? Well, we hope to account for that uh, with that p hat, or a sample proportion, by creating what's called a confidence interval. And so a confidence interval is uh, for an unknown parameter. In this case, it'll be consists of an interval of numbers. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our point estimate, or p hat, and we're going to add and subtract a margin of error to come up with a confidence interval. So for example, with uh, people voting for Barack Obama, if we do a pre-election poll, and uh, say in the pre-election poll before the general election, we find in a sample that 51% uh, think that are, are going to vote for Obama. And the margin of error is plus or minus 3%. And you've heard of, many of you have heard of that before with pre-election polls, in the, especially in the, uh, in, in the American election process. But uh, if we had Barack Obama at 51%, plus or minus 3% uh, margin of error, we would say with, with level of confidence, or a certain level of confidence, that the percentage of people that will vote for Barack Obama is 48 and 54%. Okay? Now how we come up with that confidence interval would be this formula. We would take our sample proportion, which is p hat, plus or minus our critical value, and times that by our, this is our standard deviation, but it's taking p hat times 1 minus p hat, which is the sample proportion divided by our sample size. So our p hat is, for instance, is x divided by n, where x represents the number of people like say in our, in our survey who would vote for Barack Obama and it's divided by our sample size. So say for instance it was like whatever 51% of 1200 is, that would be our x, okay, and then our sample size n would be 1200. Our critical value, these are, it depends on the level of confidence that we will be working with for a confidence interval. And so here are the levels of confidence that we usually see, or the levels of confidence that we usually see, and here are the the, the critical values that we can use for each of these uh, levels of confidence. And as a sample size, everything to the right of the plus or minus sign is the margin of error. And the requirements for the confidence interval are the sample size times our sample proportion greater, is greater than or equal to 10, and our sample size m times 1 minus the sample proportion, if that's greater than or equal to 10, then our requirement is met. So let's go through one example of that here. So before the election, you conduct a survey of Californians to see if they are in favor of Proposition 8. You take a simple random sample of 1,000 Californians, and out of your sample, 540 in your sample say they are in favor of the ballot measure. You would like to get a 95% confidence interval on those, on those who are in favor of the proposition. So the first step you need to do is get an estimated sample proportion, or p hat, of those in favor. So we would take, out of our sample of 1,000, 540 are in favor of the proposition, so it would be 540 divided by 1,000 it would be 0 0.540. The next step is we want to check the requirements. So the requirements, in this case, are met. So if we take 
uh, one, the sample size 1,000 times p hat, that's equal to 540, and then a sample size of 1,000 times 1 minus p hat, that's equal to 460. Both 540 and 460 are both greater than 10, so the requirement is met. The next step then is construct and interpret a 95% confidence interval for the true proportion of those in favor of the proposition. So the formula for that is what, what was on the last slide, and that is p hat plus or minus our critical value times the square root of p hat times 1 minus p hat divided by our sample size. So plugging in all the numbers there, we would take 0 0.540 plus or minus our critical value for a 95% confidence interval, which is 1.96, times the square root of 0 0.540 times 1 minus 0 0.540 divided by 1,000. And when we, get, when we calculate the two numbers, we would get 0 0.509 and 0 0.571. So we can interpret that by saying we are 95% confident that the true proportion of Californians are in favor of Proposition 8 uh, is between 0 0.509 and 0 0.571. Now what if we wanted to increase this to a 99% confidence interval? So for instance, so what happens to the confidence interval as the level of confidence in the sample sizes change? So if the level of confidence goes from 95 to 99, we would, um, this number here would go up. It would go, in fact, if we go back to the last slide here, it would go from 1.96 to 2.58. And so since, going back to this problem here, since this number goes up, the margin of error goes up, and in turn, the width of our confidence interval goes up. However, what if we increase our sample size? Well, if our sample size goes up, this whole entire, th this whole entire thing decreases. So therefore, the width of our confidence interval also uh, uh, decreases. So as our level of confidence increases, the width of our interval increases, and if our sample size increases, then the width of our inter confidence interval decreases. Now, we can do this calculation by hand, or what we can do is, is that we could go to um, this tool. It's an Excel tool that you can get uh, in your online textbook. There's a link to it. And what you can do here is that we can just input these numbers here. So going back to the last problem where x was 540 and n was 1,000, I would just put in 540 here and 1,000 here. Do one more time there. And then we can get our confidence interval here. We can change it from 0.95 to 0.99 for going from a 95 to 99% confidence interval, or we can change it to where it's a 90% confidence interval. And that's how we can use this tool. This is a great tool. You can use this for your homework as well as for the exam. So I'll stop the recording and I'll continue with confidence intervals in the next recording.